So, good afternoon. Today, you'll get introduced to Scala. I will show you why it's an awesome language that you should explore. After this talk, you will think to yourself, how did I spend all these years writing anything else? It will also make you think about the way you write software today. My name is Maxim Novak. I'm in the software industry for over a decade. And four, around four years ago, I joined Wix, and I, I got in love with Scala. Since then, I'm an avid Scala advocate. And Wix uh, uses Scala for most of our backend services. We have over 120 million users, over 600 microservices, and it's a live example of a very large scale project, software project, the written in Scala. Today, I will, share with, I will share with you my experience with Scala and why I think it's the best language for developer productivity. So, what is Scala? Why do you actually need it? Why should you use it? So, it's a modern JVM language uh, that works, it's, it's a modern programming language that works on the JVM. So, from one side, you get all the benefits of the JVM, all the tools you like, all the um, libraries, and the reliable runtime. On the other hand, you get a modern language that boosts your productivity. So, this session will have two parts. In the first part, I will show you uh, why Scala is so good for you. And the second part, I will give you some tips how to move to Scala. And we'll have some time for questions at the end. So, of course, we can't cover everything today. So, I've chosen a few simple um, things, simple concepts that have big impact on the way you develop software. We'll start with consistency. Java is a great language to have a lot of good stuff, but one of the biggest problems is that you have a lot of boilerplates and a lot of ceremony. So you're writing a lot just to express something very simple. So to get some feeling, we'll have a Java example, Java code here, and we'll convert it to Scala step by step. So this is Java 7 code. Anyone here still uses Java 7? Just few, okay, so we'll skip to Java 8. Well, when Java 8 was introduced, some people said, okay, now we have Java 8, we have lambdas, we don't need Scala anymore. And that's not true. The fact that Java introduced lambdas is just a validation that Scala goes to the right direction. And as you will see soon, there is much more. So. This is a simple uh, checkout class. It uh, gets the text in the constructor and have one method that gets a list of products and returns the total sum that the customer should pay. Now we'll convert this code to Scala. So first thing is in the Java, the default access modifier is package private. So we end up writing public in many of our classes. In Scala, public is the default, so we don't need it. The next thing is semicolons. We are used to it for many programming languages, and it seems okay for us to write this semicolon in the end of the line. But in Scala, the compiler is smart enough. It uses a technique that's called look ahead, and we don't need to write it ourselves. The compiler can understand it itself. Next thing is the constructor and the backend field. So all we want to say here is that we want to save the tax in a private field in the class. And it's a lot of code for this. In Scala, it will look like this. Next thing is the return. So, uh, again, in Scala, the last line is the return. So we don't need it. Next thing. We have here a list uh, parameter. A products parameter, and in Java it's considered a bad practice to change this parameter. So there is a solution. We can write final here, right? If we don't write final and we change it, we get a compilation warning. So in Scala it's the default. We don't need to write this final anywhere, everywhere. 
so it will look like this. Also, know that we change the order of the name and the type. We'll talk a bit about it later. Next thing, more boilerplate. We don't really care about this stream part here, and we're lucky that the price is double, so we can use the map to double. Otherwise, we had to work harder. So we can get rid of it. So in Scala, it will look like this. Just uh, let's uh, see if you, you're not sure what it's doing here. Like the big difference here that we are saying what we want to do and not how. So basically, we have a seek as a sequence. It's like a list in Java. So it's a sequence of products. We map them to their price, and then we sum. Let's compare it to the Java code. As you can see, it's much much concise. This Scala code does exactly the same. Come on, it's the same size of the Java Hello World program. Okay, so concise is nice, but there are much more. Scala is immutable by default. And so in imperative languages like Java, usually we do computation by mutating a variable over and over until we get the desired result. In functional languages, we have pure function functions that get data and return data without these mutations. Usually, we get cleaner and simpler code with this way. So, mo you think to yourself, why most Java developers write mutable code? Well, this is the default, and this is the easiest thing to do in Java. Here is a quote by Martin Odersky who is the author of Scala, that says that we should use immutable objects without side effects as much as we can. So naturally, Scala help us with this and make it easy for us. We'll soon see how. To understand why immutability is so bad for us, I brought a small example here. So we have a set here. We create a set, a hair set. Then we create a date with a value 2. Then we add the date to the set, and we change the time of the date to 4. Then we print uh, if the set contains the date. Now, who thinks that uh, false will be printed here? Not many. Who thinks true? Also not many, so most of you don't think. So let's see what's going to happen here. We created the hash set which implemented as an array that maps from the hash code to a bucket of objects. Then we created the date. And then we put the date into the hash set. When we do it, uh, the JVM uh, invokes uh, date.getHashCode and put it in number two. Just for simplicity, let's assume that the hash function is the same as the value. Now, when we are asking if the date is in the set, so we're invoking get hash set on the date, it's number four, and it's not there. So it's a bug that can happen really easily, and it's really hard to find it. And when we're using immutable immutability, we avoid all these kind of bugs and much more bugs. Let's continue to domain objects. Domain objects, we, we do it a lot, we create a lot of them. So again, we'll start with the Java sample. This is the same product class that we saw before. It has a name and a price. So we need a constructor and the fields to hold this. Then we need getters and setters. Actually, we said we don't want it to be immutable. Immutability is better, so we remove the setters. But we still need to string, we need equals, and we need hash code. Now, anyone here thinks that this is a reasonable amount of code to what we are getting here? No one. Good, I like you. I also think that it's too much, and in Scala I can do it with much less. Actually, in one line. All you need to do is write the word case before the class, and we get all what we saw before for free. Now, maybe some of you say, well, 
what are you talking about? Nobody really writes this code, right? I do like in my ID, click, 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 getter, setters, everything, hash code to string, generate, and it's boom, it's there. But, well, Java is a complicated language, so now we need to have a complicated ID to manage this language. And more importantly, there are many researchers that show that we read code much more than we write code. So it's nice that we can generate it, but we need to read it over and over again every time we read this class. So with Scala, the, comp the compiler does it for us. We don't need to read this code again over and over. It's much easier. What else we get with case classes? We can create new instance without the new keyword, which re reduces a bit the boilerplate. And because it's immutable, we get a copy method on each case class. So we can change this book, but if you need a discounted book, we can do book.copy and give it a new price. Then we'll get a copy of the object with a new price. Next thing is static type inference. So Scala is statically typed, but it can uh, have type inference, so it can understand itself. So you can just uh, use the, like without the type, or you can say the type. But if you will do something wrong, it will tell you. So you can't assign something that is not correct. Also, with methods. If you're trying to invoke a method, it doesn't work. So how does it work? Actually, here we have this add method. So we know that it's two parameters, a and b are ints. Sum of ints is an int. So it can be like this without the, um, the type. By convention, for public method, we will use the type because when we change stuff, we want to, um, we want uh, to, to 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 not change the public APIs, but uh, in the private case, it's very easy that we let's say we change it to double, and then all the functions that call it change to double, and it's very easy. Now we'll see some more constructs that help us have to organize our code. First thing is uh, types that let us understand functions. Again, we'll start with a Java sample here. We have this interface of a calculator, and we have one method, divide one by an integer. And then we call uh, calculator dot divide one by zero. What is the result here? We don't know. We can read the documentation, or maybe write some tests, but the signature of the function says that it's, it returns double, but it might be a null, might be an arithmetic exception, or might be double not a number. So how do we how do we do it with Scala? In Scala, we have something that's called option, which can be a none or a sum. It's a container class that can be empty or can have value. And now, when we have a method that can not, not defined for all the values, we can make it return an option of double. Now we describe what the method really returns. So divide one by zero will be none, and divide, divide one by two will be sum of a half. Now, how do we work with this option? We can do it the imperative style, like you're used in Java. So we have the result. Now we want to have the half result. So we can check if result is defined, then half result is result.get divided by two, but then what are we doing in the other case? We are not sure. And usually we don't do it in Scala. In Scala, it will look something like this. We can uh, do option.map and then if there is nothing, if there is none, it will do nothing, it will return a none, and if there is a sum, it will run this function on what's inside the container. We can write it even shorter this way. 
So what else do we get with the with the option? We can get stuff like default values. So we have some uh, option. Then we can do get or else the default value. We can have fallbacks. So the first or else the the second or else the third, etc. So it reduces a lot of this. If is defined, checks then do something else. If not defined, do something else. It's very easy, very simple. Uh, there's also a construct called try, which the concept is very similar. It can either have a success with a result or a failure with a throwable. We are not going to talk about it today. It's very similar to option, but also contains the error in case of an error. Let's see some elegant flows, because this option also we have something similar in uh, Java 8. I think it's called optional, right? Yes, but Java doesn't have this. So we have this uh, product, which might be null, and this product have a photo, which might be null, and this photo have a URL, which also might be null. Now, I'm sure that everyone in this room wrote some code like this any time in his life. So let's see how we can do it in Scala, much nicer way, because I think everyone here agreed that it's not so nice code. So in Scala, we will change the uh, variables that can be null to be an option. Th now we, we also, in, in compilation time, know that they can be that in an optional value. And we can use something that's called for comprehension. Now, you don't have to really understand it now, but believe me that it does the same thing. So basically, it takes the product opt, and if there is something, it puts it into the product. If there is none, it, re will it will stop and return none. Now we continue to the next line. It takes from the product photo to the value photo. And again, if there is something, it, it, it will assign photo to this. Otherwise, it will return none, and so on. So it's a much cleaner way to say exactly the same. Next thing is pattern matching. So in the beginning, it looks like a switch case, but it's much more powerful. Powerful. So this is how it works. By the way, any is the top level class in, uh, in Scala. So now we can match on this x. So we can match on the value. So if it will be 1, it will return the string. We can also match on any other uh, type. So now we are matching on the type and the value. We can match only on the type. And when we do this, we also casting the, the this to Boolean. So now uh, B is a Boolean. It's not any. So we can use it as a Boolean. We can match by a type and have a guard. So here we say if it's an int and it's greater than 0, positive integer. We can also have a semantic way that we want to match on the type, but we don't care about the value. So we do it with the underscore. We can also match on a union of types. And we can have a default case this way. Now, remember case classes from before? When we create case class, we get else uh, we get something else for free, which called extractors. So because it's a case class, we can also pattern match on the case class. So in this case, it it will match on the first line if it's a product, the, and the price is zero. We don't care about the name. By the way, this pattern matching works line by line. So if there is no match, it will go to the second line. So now it will match on any product. But we also get the name and the price extracted. So we don't need to do the product.name and product.price anymore. We already have them. And we can use them without all this stuff. Now, we can also write custom extractors. It's good if you want to separate, if you use classes which are not case classes or some Java classes. And it's good because we can separate the logic of extraction from the class. So in this example, I wrote an extractor. Uh, you can see it's just two lines of code. It's very easy for the 
a Java net URL and I call it HTTP. And now when you get a URL you want to match on it, your code will look something like this. Okay, so it's very clear that, okay, I got a Java net URL. Now if it's an HTTP, go here. If it's an FTP, go here. If it's file, go here. Something else, go somewhere else. It makes the code very clear, very simple to read. And as we said before, we read code much more than we write it. Parameters. Again, we'll start with the Java sample. It's a database connection. So we have the configuration of the connection here. And after we used it a while, we decided that usually we use the default port for MySQL, so we added this constructor. A while later, we said, okay, we usually use it with localhost, so we added this constructor, and this constructor, and we didn't even cover all the options. There are much more. So it's a mess. And there is a solution for this in, in Java. It's called the bil builder pattern, right? But this is very naive builder, and it's a lot of code. And also, the user of this database connection need to be aware in some way that there is a builder, builder that he should use, right? So how do we do it with Scala? In Scala, we have something that's called uh, default parameters. So the same class, the database connection, we can just say the default parameters here. Now, when we want to create it, we can just use it by order. So now we set the host, and all the other use the default. We can use this one. Or we can use it by name, if you want just the port, so we can set it this way. So it's very easy. Uh, we don't need to build all these builders anymore. Another advantage of uh, named parameters is this. Does anyone know what this true and false means? Probably no one. So again, in Java, there is a solution for this. If you, you know what you're doing, you're a good developer, you will do something like this. So the next developer coming after you will be able to read this code. But again, you need to do it. Um, in Scala, you can do it this way. It's much more readable. Usually when we have uh, booleans or ints or none or something that it's not clear what it is, we use name parameters to express this. And strings. Strings, uh, it's an, in Java we have this ancient way of writing strings. I was even embarrassed to show it here in the slides. So we'll start with the Scala example. So we, in Scala we have this thing called string inter interpolation. So we just add the character s before the string, and now we can use variables from the scope. So this thing will, will result this. And there are more, much more. So are you tired of escaping quotes everywhere? So now you can you don't need, you don't need to escape quotes anymore. You just do triple quote, and then you can use quotes inside your string. It also works for multi-line. So today, when you need to write JSON, it's very easy. You can you can even combine all of them: string and interpolation with quotes and multi-lines. You can do something like this. Think about how much code you will need to write in Java to write this. Or if you write this code in Java, then you need to change the, like add a parameter in the middle or change the order, how much changes you need to do in your code. DSLs, DSL is a domain specific language. Scala have some features that allow us to, to write uh, DSLs. Uh, so you can write on top of Scala, another language that fits to your business. In this example, I will show you Specs2, which is a testing library for Scala, and how they wrote, they wrote a DSL for testing. But before uh, we dive in, I need to show you two things that enable us to do it. 
the first thing it's called implicit classes. Implicit classes is the ability to add method to any existing class. So in this example, this is a real example from the Scala compiler code. We are taking, uh, we are adding the is class method to the Java IO file class. So now I can create a new file and call it file.isClass. Now it might be a bit uh, strange because you, you write in Java for 10 years, you don't know what is Java is class. So the ID is help us here. You see this underline here? The underline means uh, the ID edit to show us that there was an implicit call here. Also you can click Control Q in the ID, it will show you where exactly it comes from. So with this feature, we can now add methods to any type or any class. So we can write something like this, 1 to 10 will result in this range. Okay, so now we can add uh, methods to any type. The next thing is infix notation. In Java, you can write foo concat bar, but you can do foo plus bar with spaces. But actually, what you, you want to say here is something like this. They just let you in this plus as a string, and plus they implemented it in the compiler level to make it work. But in Scala, it works for any method, for any type. So for any operator, you can just not write the dot and the parentheses, it will work. So the combination of these two features will let us write something like this, 1 to 10, and the for loop will look like this. Okay, which is nice in some cases. Now, when we understood these two uh, features, let's see how specs2 looks like. So our test looks like this. So now we read it, we can see that the hello world string should contains 11 characters, and then the test. So how does it work? Of course we added, we, we don't, we removed the dots here, and we added these methods to string, and now when we run the test, it looks like this. So we don't have method names anymore, but we have this, the strings that we used to describe our tests, which is nice. Okay, now, I, I, I really love Scala. I think it's an awesome language. I think it's really boosts your productivity. But other people think like this. This is um, the Stack Overflow survey from this year. So from all the languages, Scala is number 12. From the JVM languages is the third language. And fun is not enough, right? So also profit, uh, this talks about the US, but Scala in the top with Erlang. So it also pays well. Now, when you all understood that it's good for you, also for fun and also for profit. Let's see how we proceed there and how we move to Scala. So you're starting your first steps towards Scala. And first of all, you should know that you're not alone. There are many big companies, many small startups that I know, and very rapidly growing community. This technology is is proven in production for many years in very large scale projects, like very large scale code base and very large scale, scale user base. Now, if you're a Java, J, JVM shop, it should be very easy to you because all your infrastructure already supports it. Uh, you'll ha you already have the runtime in production, you already have the ID, you have your uh, build tools, everything still working. Also, all the JVM ecosystem is available for us. There is seamless interrupt between Scala to Java, so I can call any Java API that I want from Scala. I can also call Scala API from Java, it's a bit more complicated, but it works. Um, and 
as I said before, uh, Scala is a combination of imperative and functional language, object-oriented and functional language. So when you start, you can decide how much object-oriented and how much functional you want to go. So you, you can even start writing um, what I call Jala. It's a Java with Scala syntax. And then when you learn, you improve and you move to, towards more idiomatic Scala code. Also, you can combine Scala classes and Java classes in the same project. It's not a problem, it, it just works. Um, uh, so, actually, like the move from Java to Scala can be incremental and easy. Uh, let's talk about some caveats. So, one of the biggest criticisms about Scala is that you have too much freedom as a developer. And you can easily write code that it's hard to read later. And I saw a few times that a new developer has come, learns a lot of cool features, and going crazy, uses a lot of cool features, everything, and then it's really hard to read this code. So there is, I put here a blog post that, that I really recommend you to read anyway, even if you don't, I, I think that it applies to any programming language. Basically, it says that you should use the tool with the least power that solves your problem. Okay, don't go crazy. You have a problem with a simple solution, solve it with a simple solution. It applies really to any programming language, and I think it also comes like, with the maturity and seniority of a developer. So, you should be aware that with the freedom comes the responsibility, and you need to be aware of what you're doing. Next thing is slower compilation time. So of course we saw that the compiler is much smarter here. It does a lot of stuff for us. And it can't come for free. So the compiler here is slower than, uh, than Java. If it's a big project, it might be annoying. But if you're using microservices and you have a lot of small projects, it's not an issue. It's just a bit slower. Next thing here is tooling. Um, so as I said, most of the tooling will, will work, but some, some of the tooling is still not completely there. For example, the IDE is, uh, is better for Java, and some tools are not completely there. And last thing is recruiting. If you are writing Scala, it's not easy to find experienced Scala developers. So it might be a problem if you want to hire a lot of seniors and experienced ex developers. But it's gaining popularity lately. And for example, in Wix, uh, we are looking for good software developers and not developers of a specific language. So it's actually like a filter for us because we want to uh, hire people that want to get out of their comfort zone, learn something new, work with modern new technologies. So of course, it takes some uh, learning curve and mentoring, but I think it's worth it for the long run. So let's, uh, I'll show you some more tips to move from Java to say, Scala. Um, first thing is, if you're not sure that you want to do it, or your management don't want you to do it, you can start writing tests in Scala. Like I showed you before, there is uh, there are quite a few very good uh, testing libraries. Uh, I showed you before Specs2, and there is also Scala tests. They have a lot of features. They have very cool DSL for to run your tests. So you can have in the, your same project uh, the production code in Java and the test in Scala. After you try it, the production is not in danger, so you can you can move to the production code if you if you like it. Next thing is you start converting your classes one by one. So the same project can have Java and Scala classes. So you you can just come to one class that you're working in. You don't like it. Usually when I when it I ha we have some legacy code in Java. When I find the 200 lines of code in Java, I convert it to Scala. It's like 30, 40 lines. 
So you can, if you're working with IntelliJ, you see this here, convert to Scala. So, of course, it's not perfect. It will convert it to Scala syntax, but it will still have the Java, like the same thing that you did before. But it's a good start. You do this, then you can refactor it, you run your test, you see that everything good, and then you continue. Another issue that might uh, have some friction is the uh, collections. In Scala, there is a different collections library. Of course, it's immutable. As I said before, Scala is immutable by default. So they introduce a new collections library. And many times you call to Java API, or you, you, you're working with Java. So there is this library in Scala that lets you convert to Java like Java collection to Scala collections or Scala collection to Java collections very easily. You just import this namespace and you can do a dot as Java dot as Scala on the any collection. It's it like adds the extension method like we said before. Another thing is sometimes when you work with Java libraries, they expect they expect your classes to have getters and setters, which we don't have in Scala. So if you do work with such library, you can just uh, add the bin property annotation, and the compiler will generate the getters and setters for the compatibility with these libraries. Um, last thing is a tip to preserve the git history. If you have a, a file called the foo.java, and now you rename it to foo.scala and do some changes in the code, um, then when you will uh, look at the git history of the file, it will start from the Scala code. And you want it back to the Java days, right? So you need to do it in two steps. First of all, you rename the file to .scala and commit. I know that it won't compile, but you rename and commit. Then you fix the code and commit again. If you do it in this way of two commits, the history will go back to the Java days because the Git will understand that it's the same file. So, uh, to wrap up, we, we covered very briefly some of the basic concepts of Scala. And this is good for you to get, like, you got some tips to start with Scala. And um, I hope you enjoyed and you already planning to move. If you want more resources, uh, here are some uh, basic uh, places to start, to start uh, basic stuff to learn Scala, and also some advanced topics if you want to um, to find more stuff. Um, and uh, now we'll have some time for questions. Anyone? Yeah, over there. Hey, just a second, I don't hear you. Oh, OK. Uh, maybe you compare Scala to Kotlin in context of uh, Java replacement. If yes, what is your opinion on this? Well, um, I don't know Kotlin good enough. I've read a bit about Kotlin. I know that it's uh, getting popularity. It's also been in the slide of the loved languages. I hear, I hear uh, good feedbacks. As far as I know, they're pretty similar. Like the criticism about Scala, it have too many features, and in Kotlin they have just the right amount of features. So that's what I know about the differences. I can't tell more. But I think it's also a good language. And there was a question there, anyone? The ah, the same question. <laughs> okay. Anyone else? Yeah. Uh, you mentioned about tooling support. How does the tooling support look like in, in IntelliJ, for instance, for Scala? As we know, Scala is a much more complex language, and for Java, we have a lot of auto code under completion, refactoring, and so on. So, how it looks like for Scala? Okay, so I work with IntelliJ, and uh, most of the stuff works. Uh, the refer as I said before, the refactoring is not so powerful as in Java, but I also find myself use it much less because I write much less code. 
The debugging is also, it's pretty good, but it's not perfect. Um, but it works pretty good. I mean, it's not the same level as Java, and it's improving all the time. Like uh, three years ago, it was like much behind. Now it's almost the same level as Java. Regarding uh, build tools, you can use um, Maven or a, a Scala build tools like SBT, or there are many build tools. Benchmarking tooling, you can use the same, JMH, all this stuff. Anyone else? Yeah, yeah, there, there is someone there. Uh, so, which uh, web framework for Scala do you prefer or do you suggest for using? Well, um, in Wix we use the Spring uh, from legacy reasons. I think that the most popular uh, uh, fr web framework for Scala is Play today. Um, I didn't. Tr I just played with it a little bit. I didn't uh, try it in production. But any like I think Play is the most common in Scala. But any JVM web framework will work. More questions? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, how do you deal at weeks with build times in practice? Because with what? Uh, at your company, uh, how do you deal with long build times for Scala? It's usually, say, 10 times slower than Java. Yes, so for big projects, it's, it's annoying. So we are trying to have, uh, we have some uh, kind of legacy big projects, but we are trying to build microservices. So when you have microservices, it doesn't really matter, it's like a little bit more. It's not uh, 10 times more. So instead of five seconds, it will take 10 seconds, but you don't really feel, like in small projects, it's, you, don't, you, you really don't feel it. So we're trying to break our big pro like we have still few big projects and we are breaking them to smaller pieces all the time. Not only because of Scala, but because it's a better architecture, but it helps us with Scala as well. What's the next big thing that's coming for Scala? What's in the pipeline that's going to be added in the next version? Uh, well, uh, there's like a lot of talking about uh, this stuff. Uh, we are now at Scala 2.12.6. Uh, uh, and uh, there are like, Scala 3 about to come out. So they're changing the compiler and they're changing a lot of the um, infrastructure and there should be a lot of improvements in the future. By the way, uh, something uh, that uh, may be worth saying is that uh, Scala uh, sometimes break compatibility. So from like one side, it's not so good because you need to fix your code. But on the other hand, it can uh, evolve and be better and not stuck behind like Java that say that like it's important to save the compatibility. So this is like also a question if people will move to Scala three because of the compatibility issues. Yeah, okay. I'll hang around in the conference. I'll be happy to talk to you if you want to talk to me later. So catch you later. Thank you.